example. So they really, you know, talked her up a lot, saying this is, you know, this is an authentic storyteller. In fact, if you go to Kassel today, the German city in Hessen, Kassel, you can even, I mean, it's touristy, but you can go out to the, the suburb that used to be the village where she lived, and you can, uh, you know, here, go to a bar, I think, in, 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 sort of in the area. I don't know if her father's inn is still around, the building, but you can go to an inn in the area and hear some actor give, give fairy tales and, and her persona. Um, so, again, we come back to that question that I mentioned at the beginning. What are we dealing with when we, when we hold the Brothers Grimm book in our hand? Um, is, it, is it history, right, or is it art? And, um, so, but first, I think I'll say a little bit more about, uh, you know, who the Grimm's were and why they were doing this, to answer that question. Um, the Grimm's themselves, Jakob and Wilhelm, they're called the, uh, the Brothers Grimm, but there are other brothers, by the way. They had a sister, too. Um, they were the children of an initially well-to-do family with connections to the royal government of Hessen, actually. Their father worked for the government, but he died relatively young, and uh, that was pretty much that. The breadwinner is gone. And, uh, you know, they grew up as children dependent on the kindness of their connections. And that's not bad. A lot of people had a lot worse then. But, you know, they still had it kind of rough as young men. And it didn't help that, you know, again, Napoleon was uh, in the process of conquering Europe at the time. Um, but they managed to uh, complete law degrees since they had turned out to be uh, much more interested in uh, what you call popular antiquities or antiquities than in practicing law. Uh, so they ended up working as uh, librarians in the uh, Hessen State Library and Archives. That was sort of their first career move. Um, so, and as librarians, their hobby was sort of to be historic, broadly speaking, not historians in the, sort of the modern technical sense, but historians. Uh, so on the side, they, they published linguistic, cultural, literary, and legal history, and of course also the folk tales. And that is to say, at the time, they were among the first wave of what we call you know, philologists. Uh, and it's a somewhat old-fashioned term for what we might today divide into several sub-disciplines, uh, namely what I listed above, uh, literary studies, literary and linguistic history, cultural history, and you know, as assessed through ancient and medieval texts. So, um, so why did they go this route? Well, the, the, um, the answer is kind of nationalism. Uh, and it has a lot to do with Napoleon, actually, I think. I mean, everyone loves folk and fairy tales, right? Uh, fantasy and so forth. And that wasn't any different back then. As I said, everyone already knew the fairy tales. But the Grimm's actually didn't care about fantasy, even though that's kind of the genre in which uh, they're nowadays most often evoked. Um, and that's also not even what they were famous for at the time. And when I say they, I, mean, I mostly mean Jacob, because Jacob was kind of, Wilhelm was a very smart guy. Jacob was kind of a genius. Um, so that's not what they were famous for in their day, right? As I said, the book still sold poorly initially. Um, Jacob Grimm became famous basically on two fronts. Uh, oh, that's a representation of philology. You know, all the Germanic languages. But this is what Jacob Grimm got famous for. And you know, four volume works on Deutsche Grammatik. This is not the stuff of fame and fortune today. But um, it was back then, there was quite a lot of interest in what they were doing sort of with the history of language, or what Jacob Grimm was doing with the history of language. He, uh, he published at least the first, the first volume or two of, of Deutsche Grammatik, and he made quite a reputation for himself. And uh, so that got him, made him somewhat famous in certain circles, you know, more educated circles. Um, but even more so, he got, uh, he got it, it made his reputation such that he was able to get a a professorship, a position as professor in, uh, in Göttingen, which um, at the time was, uh, well, I guess, well, let's see, Göttingen, I think, is in Niedersachs now, but at the time it was a part of the Kingdom of Hanover. Um, so um, so he, he and Wilhelm both moved to uh, Hanover, uh, excuse me, to Göttingen within the Kingdom of Hanover. Um, and uh, Hanover, when they moved there, this is how they also got famous, by the way, or even how they became household names. Hanover was a constitutional monarchy at the time. But upon the death of the old king in 1837, there was this new king, his brother, Ernest Augustus. And uh, that is him right there. It's not a great picture, but that's him. Um, and this guy decided that he didn't need the constitution. 
Um, and this created something of an ethical dilemma for Jakob Grimm because professors, uh, it's still this way in Germany, but it was, it was in also as, as, as it was then, professors were um, sort of like police officers, but not really. They were, they were beamta, or they are beamta, that is uh, officers of the state in a certain way. And Jakob Grimm, when he had moved to Göttingen, had had to take an oath to uphold the Constitution in, in, a certain, in, in that sense. Um, and um, so the problem was that when, the, when this guy came along and said, we don't need the Constitution anymore, he said, you have to take a new oath, to me personally. And um, so Jacob had a, had, had a, he thought that would violate his, his prior oath, and so he had a problem with that. And he joined with, um, well, Wilhelm came along too, but he joined with uh, Friedrich Christoph Dahlmann uh, to uh, the Göttinger Sieben. We have, this is Jacob here, this is Wilhelm here, this is Dahlmann, Vanna, and a few of these other guys. These were uh, university professors in Göttingen who all protested this decision for the ki of the king. And um, I want to take a guess what happened to them. Yeah, they, they lost their jobs. So uh, um, that, that was, and this was kind of a blow for the university because these were all high profile guys. Um, uh, that Dahlman, too, I mean, not, not just the Grimm's. I mean, the Grimm's are the, nowadays the most famous of them, but at the time, Dahlman was probably more, more prominent. But um, so, you know, it was a, something of a loss for the university, but they were all booted out. And uh, so Jakob and Wilhelm, you know, packed back to Hessen. And uh, eventually they got jobs in Berlin, that is Prussia. They got jobs in Prussia. Uh, the, the, the king of Prussia didn't want to take them on immediately because uh, you know, they had just been kicked out of Hanover and that was kind of a hot topic um, because nobody at the time really wanted to uh, you know, hire rabble rousers. But these, they were famous guys, right? So uh, eventually Berlin, they got a call to Berlin. Um, and that's how they became household names. In a way, it's comparable to uh, say, someone like Noam Chomsky today. Um, that is, yes, everyone, people know Noam Chomsky is a linguist, right? Uh, he has, he's, he's famous kind of in his scholarly right, but uh, he's more famous in a way for his political activism. And uh, you know, I think the same is true for Jakob Grimm particularly, is that both of them became famous more for their political activism initially than for their, their philological work, uh, or, and certainly not for the folk tales. Um, but the good thing, just on a side note, the good thing, and the good thing about for Jakob Grimm and, and Wilhelm too, is that unlike Noam Chomsky, you know, they started off radical as young people, that you know, they, they were getting kicked out of kingdoms and so forth. Um, but you know, over time, uh, relative to society, they became less radical, not because they changed, but because society changed. Noam Chomsky hasn't been as lucky. But um, that's how they really became household names, was, was politics. So, but by this point, this is the 1830s, right? The, the, you know, the, this first edition that hadn't sold very well was, was, uh, had been published back in 1812. Uh, so again, that's not what made them famous. But you know, at the time, what really, what the critics got to wasn't just the question of when they published the first volume. The first question was, was yes, who is this for? Is it for children and so forth? And it's for children. Then the problem with the tales was really their rawness. Um, that is, the stories were pretty, I, I don't mean raw in the sense of vulgar, though they could be, um, but you know, they, had a, they did have a story in there like um, you know, the children who played, uh, this one didn't make it out of the first edition, it didn't get republished in later editions, uh, it's children who played slaughter, and you know, uh, there's this, you know, there, it's a story about here's a kid, I'll, I'll be the butcher, you be the pig, and uh, you'll catch the bucket, you'll have to hold the bucket for the blood, and they chop this kid up, and you know, people, parents are looking at this saying, I'm supposed to read this to my kids, right? So, um, um, but it, I mean, it wasn't just that, it was that, uh, because actually, generally speaking, the violence in the tales wasn't really the problem that people had a problem with. We're in America here, I think we understand this. People were more concerned with, uh, let's say, different kinds of improper, Bart Simpson type behavior, not, but not just that, but also the little bit of sex that was in there was kind of, you know, uh, more of a problem than, um, than, than the violence. Because actually in later editions, you know, stu weird stuff like the children who, that story about children playing slaughter, weird stuff uh, like that aside, most of the stories became more violent over time. They actually edited the tales to become, you know, to punish villains more, to publish villains more violently. Um, and they, actually, I, I think I have a whole list of these here, yeah. Different kinds of ways that they, they change the tales over time. So, 
you know, um, you know, they shot for some sort of moral improvements. You know, fairy tales, and Charles Perrault, for instance, the French author, he, he tacked on, you know, uh, explicit morals at the end of stories uh, in, in verse. Um, they didn't do that, but they did try to make the morals more implicit, to make them more acceptable for parents and children. So they, you know, Rapunzel in the first edition gets pregnant, and they got rid of that. Um, you know, this other one, King, King Thrushbird is basically uh, the taming of the shrew, you know, from Shakespeare. I mean, it's the same basic idea. Um, so, in, you know, in later editions, the, the lady repents. Um, you know, there's some other, I, I don't want to go through these two, two uh, in detail, but the main, because the main point is they're, over time, they're trying to improve the stories to make them more, more viable as a book. Um, you know, sort of ex accentuating the wickedness of villains. Uh, you know, same thing here, like in the first uh, edition here, you know, the devil is just kind of an old guy who has a few lines. In later editions, he's, he's limping, he laughs, funny, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then also changes in style. They definitely tried to make the stories more German. That is, they would replace words like in the first edition where they'd have prince, which is, of course, a French word or a French-derived word. They'd replace that with Königsohn or, you know, they, there's actually... You know, technically in German, if you talk about, you know, das Mädchen, right? This is neuter for entirely grammatical reason. This means girl, right? And girls are, of course, feminine. Um, and in, in uh, but in German, just by an accident of grammar and, and the building of this, how this word is constructed, it turns out to be neuter, right? The grammatical gender of the word. And, you know, in Germany, nobody actually refers to a little girl as s, as it, right? In the Grimm's Tales, they do, though. They, they keep that, that consistent. Um, that sort of grammatical consistency as a part of the style. But in German, nobody actually talks like that. Little girls, they still refer to them with the, the feminine pronoun, Z, uh, as far as I know, as far as, I mean, as far as I've heard. But the Grimm's, they, they kind of kept up that, that sort of artificial adherence to grammar. Um, you know, then the changes in narrative, just making things more logical, because folk tales aren't necessarily logical, right? Um, but they wanted to make these more appealing to the public. So, okay, yeah, this is the next thing. Um, So that, that was their efforts in, um, that was part of their efforts in, 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 um, in responding to criticism. And that criticism was, you know, what I said, a lot of it was, you know, are, are these stories moral? What's, what's, you know, and who is this for? Um, another point of criticism was, though, that the, the stories were too scholarly. And it's also, you know, as I said, this, the tales didn't uh, sell very well. Uh, but they also, to the second edition, they added a third volume. And the third volume didn't have stories in it. It was all commentary and notes. And if you think the, story, the, the, the volumes with the tales didn't sell well, think how the, the basically what the appendix was, right? That didn't sell well either. And they, they got a lot of grief for that too, but they didn't actually back down on that. They made a lot of changes to the stories, um, but they, didn't, they actually kept sort of the, the scholarly, well, except in one exception, in 1825. And this is when the, the tales became actually somewhat competitive on the book market. In 1825, they, they, they cut all the scholarly stuff. They got rid of all the weird stories. Uh, they took the 50 best ones, well, best, however, you, you know, however they define best, and published those as the so-called Kleine Ausgabe, the small edition. And that sold decently uh, because it was something that people actually wanted to read. Um, I'm just curious, how many is that? Has anyone here read the entire collection? Yeah, yeah. A few people, yeah, okay, yeah, the gammonist in there, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, well, most people don't because there's a lot of weird stuff in there, especially if you read the first edition. So, um, so nobody actually at the time criticized them for changing the stories, I mean, for making all these, these, these different kinds of editions. People at the time thought this was great. Um, but nowadays, People look back at that and say, well, why did they do that? that they, were, they were watering down the authenticity, right? In the first edition, if, if, I mean, if the Grimm's are just sitting there and editing these stories, uh, you know, on what criteria are they doing that? And doesn't that make them sort of, you know, not really folklore, right? Because as I say, I'll, I'll go back here, right? Folklore is, uh, you know, collective improvisational authorship, not authorship by the Grimm's, right? Uh, it's transmitted orally, not you know, on the editor's desk, right? Composed anonymously and so forth. So, you know, critics nowadays tend to look at that and say, you know, why did they do that? And my theory is this. 
you know, as I said, the Grimm's were sort of broadly speaking historians. And, you know, the job of an historian is not broad, you know, broadly speaking, isn't to sort of reproduce the past. I guess I'd put it that way. You know, amateur historians, professional historians might take part in like, I don't know, reenactments, you know, Civil War reenactments or something like that. But nobody mistakes that for history, right? That's art. Um, it's, it's theater, though it's theater with, you know, a pedagogical purpose, but it's still not, you know, it's still not you know, writing history. Uh, but there is one sort of exception to that rule in that, in that historians, literary critics, philologists do have to kind of reproduce the past when they make an edition of a medieval or ancient text. So, and this is actually one thing that the Grimm's worked on as libra librarians, one of their first, uh, not one of their first, but it was one among, among their first publications, is, you know, they were working in a library and they, you know, found manuscripts there, medieval manuscripts, uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and so they became, they were sort of early paleographers along with uh, several other people like, people like Karl Lachmann. Um, and, uh, you know, in this sense, I guess I'll say there's a real science to uh, paleography. That is, reading me medieval manuscripts and saying what's in them. Um, because a good pale, there are, first off, because there are right and wrong answers, right? The text says what it says. And also because, um, you know, a good paleographer will show her work so that others can verify it. Um, so as I said, this is the Lay of Hildebrand. And I'm just bringing this one up because it's one that the Grimm's happened to work on. Um, and uh, they, they, um, it's one of the earliest written texts written in Old High German. Um, and as you can see here, it can be kind of difficult to uh, you know, decipher what the letters are. So you know, the job of a paleographer is to make it easier on the rest of us to look at this stuff. And, you know, the thing about this one is it's an unicum. That is, this is the only, when it comes to medieval manuscripts, this is the only place you're going to find this particular text, this particular story, which is the story of Hildebrandt, you know, fighting his son, and nobody knows who wins because it cuts off at the end. But, um, you know, in, in a unicum, because this is a unicum, it cuts off at the end, we don't know what happens at the end, right? Or if something, there's a smudge here, we're out of luck, right? We might be able to read it with UV rays or something. They didn't have UV rays in 18... Uh, or UV light in the 1800s, but, well, they did, but not in, you know, anyway. Um, you know, they couldn't use it to read stuff. But, um, you know, if in that case, you're just kind of out of luck. But, and here's where it gets problematic, not just for, and this is where it gets problematic for the Grimm's too, is that if you take another text, um, if you have, like, say, something with um, uh, two medieval texts with, uh, or several med medieval manuscripts with variations, right? Um, at the same time as the Grimm's were working, there was this guy named Karl Lachmann who was working on uh, various editions of the Nibelungenlied, which is, which is sort of a national, in the 19th century, was considered the national myth of Germany in a lot of, and Wagner worked on it and so forth. So, I mean, if you just take two, two, two I just took two excerpts here just to show you what kind of variation you can, that can show up in a medieval, in a couple of different medieval manuscripts in the same with the same story. You see there's some pretty minor stuff here, right? Different words. Okay, there was a, there was a, a beautiful girl in Burgundy. Here, here it's, or it grew up a beautiful girl in Burgundy. Here it's just a very noble girl in Burgundy. Same basic idea. Um, there was nobody more beautiful. You know, Krimhild was, was her name, uh, or what, what she was called. And then you see a little bit different variation here. You know, she was a beautiful woman, or you know, or actually, this is a little bit, not quite she was, but, or, you know, she was, again, same basic idea, right? And then the job of the, the paleographer, at least in the early 19th century, was to um, try to decide what's older, what's better, right? And this is a very problematic thing to say. Um, what's, you know, how do we, when we just look at these, how do we know, right, what the author originally wrote? Because presumably at some point, somebody sat down and wrote a book. Right, the Nibelungen lead. Then he, you know, handed it off to Monk A, and Monk A copied it, and maybe he did it perfectly, but he handed it off to Monk B, and a few mistakes crept in, right? And then off to Monks C and D, where the, the mistakes multiply. So the job of the paleographer, as perceived in the 19th century, was to figure out, well, what did the original, how do we get through these mistakes? How do we edit the mistakes out so that we can, uh, so that we can get to the original text, right? Um, and uh, nowadays, that's not really necessarily an accepted idea among paleographers. That's so controversial. But you can see here, for instance, this is the edition. 
or a edition, the most popular edition 